So, good morning. Sunday morning, 10.15, sunny in Bruno. What a better place to be than in D105. So, I'm glad everybody survived the party yesterday. Nobody got wet from the outside, maybe just from the inside. The people that got wetter from the inside maybe are not here, so I'm really happy that uh, you showed up. Thank you. So, we will talk about how much open source is in cloud services uh, today. My name is Marcel Hiltz. I'm a managed OpenShift uh, black belt. It's a mouthful of a term, but I'm essentially um, selling managed OpenShift um, to customers in a technical way. And my colleague Roberto Caratala de Madrid is also with me. Um, he's way longer in this business uh, than me. So, we'll talk about what is ROSA, Arrow and OSD. These are some fancy acronyms. Then we go through the various days of setting up clusters um, at scale. So, starting from day zero, where we fully automate the deployment, then day one, which is not really a day, where we're going to, in the, in, to the initial configuration of these clusters, and then the ongoing maintenance and operations of these clusters, so monitoring logs and stuff. And then finally, how do we fix things if something goes wrong? And hopefully we come to a good conclusion on um, what is in there for you guys, because not everybody is supposed to run thousands of clusters, maybe just a couple of them, but you can draw some inspiration. So, what is ROSA, Arrow, OSD? Is it something that you shoot with your crossbow, or just a color, or just a triple letter acronym that nobody really cares about? So let's take a step back and look at what we're doing at Red Hat for the last, how many years, 25 years? 25 years of productizing open source projects. So we pick these fancy projects there, and in the middle there you see Kubernetes. So we take that, put it into OKD, which is the upstream of OpenShift, and then we productize it. And it's not just one product, but there's a multiple, a multitude of products. Uh, so essentially, OpenShift is a Kubernetes distribu uh, distribution, uh, which has some other projects also involved. And most of you are probably familiar with deploying OpenShift yourself, where you run the installer. We had many, many installers of uh, deploying this. Sometimes it was Ansible. These days it's a Golang binary. And then it provisions some infrastructure, yada, yada, yada. Um, that's on the bottom there. So you can deploy it everywhere you like to go. That's the whole value proposition of OpenShift. And you, also deploy it into these cloud services. So we have it running on AWS, which is ROSA, Red Hat OpenShift on AWS. We have it running on Azure, A-R-O, Azure, Red Hat OpenShift. So now these acronyms make a bit more sense. We have it also running on the IBM cloud, which is called ROX. I don't know whether no, K, ROIC, ROIC, okay. So we're getting close to making actually some sense into these acronyms. And there's OpenShift dedicated. This is how it all started. So you can also deploy it into uh, Google Cloud. And this business of running OpenShift clusters for customers got uh, so popular that we moved out of OpenShift dedicated into these other clouds as well. So this is typically what you would have to do as a as somebody who operates OpenShift. Uh, you take care of this bottom layer where you set up your infrastructure. Then as you move up to the stack, uh, you have to configure your, uh, your network. You have to configure this control plane, the master nodes uh, that take care of your cluster, et cetera, and yada, yada, yada. Um, but essentially, you probably just want to run workloads. Like, uh, if you installed uh, Red Hat Enterprise Linux, you didn't want to care about who's packaging these things and who's doing the upgrade, but you just want to install an Oracle database or whatever. And in OpenShift, it's not different. So what if we could shrink this picture just to this, where you just care about your workloads, you care about setting up your namespaces and operating your stuff. So let Red Hat and uh, our SREs do all the work for you. 
So SREs is uh, coming a long way, right? So like 13 years ago, we just deployed stuff, threw it over the wall, and then that's the ops people take care of it, and fingers crossed that we didn't do it on a, on an, on an, uh, on a weekend before we got to a popular swimming pool in Brno, and then that's the people who cared the pay, uh, the, wore the pager take care of it. No, we tried to merge people from development using, uh, um, and, and from operations, using the tools from both sides, the best of both worlds. This is how DevOps got into place. And I like to see SRE as an implementation of DevOps. So if you're doing SRE, you are doing DevOps in a certain way. That doesn't mean that if you are doing DevOps, you are doing SRE. So SREs are people that take care and run your operations, um, but they're also closely working together with your engineering teams, but they are not the engineering team. So the SRE people at Red Hat that manage all these clusters at, at scale, so really think about um, um, hundreds and thousands of clusters that they manage with a small team, um, they are also developers, so, so they are building all these services to manage and monitor OpenShift environments uh, or to deploy these clusters. So there's a lot of engineering involved. And for doing this reliably, you need to automate a lot of stuff. So automating, um, adding storage, capacity, auto scaling, um, all that stuff, and make it repeatable so that you can essentially scale because you don't want to hire more and more people the more clusters you um, deploy. And then, obviously, you're not done as in pre-sales once you install the cluster and then you can tear it down and just show that everything works, but you actually want to use that cluster and uh, as it's software, there's also bugs, so we need to observe this um, environment, uh, make it reliable and act upon any incidents. So that's observability and reliability, day two operations. So we'll take you through this journey on the left where somebody is installing a cluster with a click of a mouse button or via your CLI. Then what is being kicked off in the background to install that cluster, um, do the initial configuration and then monitor it from day two to day n. So although it's days, the um, whole cycle until to get day two is just taking 30 minutes or 40 minutes. But uh, so if we would install a cluster right now at the beginning of this session, at the end we would have a cluster run up and running, which is pretty awesome, I think. So Roberto will take care of the next. Hello. Right, we have only one mic. So now that um, we will start with the day zero operations, we need to deploy a fully automated and scalable clusters. So we have an initial problem. We are a DevOps team. We need to deploy our clusters in a scalable and maintainable way and also easy. And we want to deploy our OpenShift uh, Kubernetes clusters across multiple hyperscalers. We have AWS, we have Azure, Google Cloud, and IBM. So we have a plan, and we need to deploy all of these projects that we have in the CNCF, and we have several meetings. We try to have several meetings with business, and the business guy wants to put everything, wants to put storage, wants to put AI, wants to put every single piece of software out there, but we need to do it scalable. We need to start working, 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 and we end like this. So for avoiding to this DevOps guy have this mess, uh, we need to have an easy solution and a scalable solution in order to deploy and maintain our different clusters across different clouds and maintain it and uh, also have this lifecycle and the supportability. And we want to introduce Hive to save the day. So Hive is an operator that runs on top of, uh, as a service, on top of Kubernetes or OpenShift, and it's using to provision and perform also the initial configurations and day two ops, 
And for provisioning OpenShift, we have uh, OpenShift installer behind the hood. And also, we support um, different cl uh, cloud providers, AWS, Azure, Google Cloud, and IBM Cloud. Also, we have this uh, architecture, more or less. We won't be uh, a deep dive in this architecture, but um, in the top, we have essentially the uh, high namespace, the brain, and for every single um, managed cluster, we have one cluster namespace that will run and will store the different secrets and the different pieces and components for doing that. And for deploying one cluster, just we need to deploy a cluster deployment that is in a CRD as an extension of a Kubernetes API, and we will define what is the platform uh, that we are trying to deploy and also the different components across that. And it's part, hybrid's part of a upstream project that is called Open Cluster Management, that is a community-driven project focused uh, for multi-clustering and also multi-cloud scenarios for deploying the uh, clusters, also the works, and deploying at scale uh, and maintaining the different Kubernetes and um, OpenShift clusters. We have a downstream project that is called ACM, or Advanced Cluster Ma uh, Management for Kubernetes in order to deploy these OpenShift clusters and Kubernetes clusters as well at scale in different uh, platforms across uh, the different regions as well. So, now that we have our um, lovely uh, cluster deployed in, uh, I don't know, different hyperscalers, we need to perform the initial configurations because it's just blank, but we need to perform the first uh, configuration. So we need TLS encryption. We need TLS encryption everywhere, as these two bodies wants to. And for that reason, we have set uh, an operator to managing the certificates at scale. We need to be able in scale to manage the different uh, certificates and we need to provision the certificates, we need to reissue uh, the certificates once is, uh, for example, um, this expiration date and also revoking the certificates once we uh, read off these clusters or the, uh, the commission these clusters. You have also this deep dive, more or less, that explains how this works um, uh, in a deep uh, dive way. And brilliant, we have our certificates in our cluster, and now how about shipping and maintaining day two ops configurations at scale? So we deploy our clusters, we deploy also our certificates, but how about the day two configurations, Marcel? We can do it manually, right? Yeah. Or using GitOps, right? It's a very hot topic. Or using resource management. Well, it's Matic. But it's not Matic. We are using some sort of GitOps, but we are using a piece of a software that is uh, included in Hive that is called SyncSet in order to facilitate the resource management. We are shipping the different um, objects and day to ops using this in more or less the GitOps approach. But in uh, the country, for example, that Argo City is immediately syncing, we are using synsets in order to not stress the API of the different clusters and also to try to reapply once um, it's the cluster installed and in ensure that it's maintained across the uh, different life cycle. So we are maintaining also the contents once are updated. So once we have this in place, we need to ship the configuration and we are using managed cluster config. This managed cluster config is using the Hive selector Synsex. It's not really an operator, it's a bunch of different YAMLs across um, a repository, and it's able to bundle these in a template and ship across the different uh, day two ops. So we have these two uh, ways uh, and methods to use it in uh, OSD and ROSA and also in ARO. So this is an example. Uh, a brief example of how you can put it in uh, one repository and ship. This is a real example how the SREs ship this. So if you click it, this is the day two uh, configuration and day two ops that are shipping also across the different managed clusters. And imagine that, yeah, we all uh, ship our um, uh, cluster. We have the cluster ready and we are handing over to the users. And these two DevOps guys that are super uh, excited uh, have a call from the business and say, yeah, no, uh, you need to turn around your ship and in, uh, instead of going 
that way you need to turn around and going um, backwards. But it's not possible. Yeah, hold my beer. And after that, we'll change one thing and another thing and another thing and they will be stuck. So they said, running Kubernetes in production, they said, it will be easy, they said. In order to prevent users to do uh, and to break clusters, we need to put some world rails. We need to put some secure boundaries. And for that reason, we are using validating a mission webhooks. So these webhooks prevent certain customer operations. They will prevent to break the cluster. And for that reason, we are putting these uh, admission webhooks in order to um, Mm, prevent to anyone remote, uh, remove uh, or change the namespaces, also Prometheus rules, and a bunch of different things that will be able to prevent mm, to the users to um, mess around with the cluster and will put some uh, world rules to the different clusters. And now we are heading to the day two. So, day two, or minutes 20 into cluster operation. So we made sure that uh, the cluster is up and running. You can't mess around with it, and if you mess around with it, it gets reworded. Um, but we need to also look at what's going on there. So platform monitoring is essentially not different from your everyday platform monitoring that you would do in your own OpenShift cluster. So you have a bunch of alerting rules, the out-of-the-box OpenShift alerting rules, and then some SRE added alerting rules that are more specific to these managed environments. Then you have a Prometheus instance running on your, on this local cluster on the customer side or on the, in the cloud, which is collecting metrics, which are then exposed to an alert manager, which is also part of uh, the Prometheus uh, suite. And then it sends these alerts to PagerDuty, which is a paid service where you can manage your incidents. It sends it to GoAlert, um, which is also a paid service, but it's more an open source service. So they're using this, um, this mix of uh, alerts. I actually don't know what alerts are going to which service, but uh, it's always good to choose from. And there's Deadman Snitch. Uh, so if nobody heard of Deadman Snitch, uh, definitely something to look into. I have it running in my home setup to alert me when my home Prometheus is going down. So it's uh, for one rule, it's uh, free. It's basically the poor guy that has to pull, uh, push the button, and if he falls off dead, then he releases the button, and then we know this cluster and doesn't reporting back home. So that's, that's essentially the setup that we have uh, to monitor these clusters. And obviously, we don't want to have all the alerts uh, coming in because you know it. If there are too many alerts, nobody cares about these alerts. And then the alerts don't matter so much. So we have some inhibition rules in place. I don't have too many memes in my slides. I'm more the emoji guy. so. These are stock emojis from um, my operating supplier. I'm the meme guy. He's the meme guy. <laughs> so how do we configure these things? Because as you heard, we are not using GitOps. Because otherwise, you would have to have an, uh, a pull request or some entry in your Git repository for every customer cluster that's being set up. So how do you, would you manage a lot of alert managers in random clusters uh, being set up? And therefore, we have the configure alert manager operator, which is installed in this cluster. And essentially, it watches for some secrets and config maps to appear or not to appear. Um, it does some health checks, whether the cluster is set up um, already. And um, these health checks are then reported back to Prometheus. So we hook into that uh, normal operator, uh, monitoring pipeline there. And the secrets themselves are deployed via sync sets. And once these secrets are in place, um, we have some other operators 
configure go alert operator, the pager duty operator, and the deadman snitch operator, which um, no, actually, these uh, operators in the, in the bottom are responsible for deploying the secrets. So um, they are using, again, the sync sets from Hive to ship out the configuration to these clusters if they are needed or in, in maybe they change. And then the configure alert manager operator takes care of configuring alert manager. So now we have a programmable pipeline of configuring alert manager to your needs to the environment um, that the cluster is running in without any GitOps involved and with a programmable way because we don't want to do things manually. Um, these are all open source, so if you happen to uh, configure a lot of alert managers, think twice, maybe you want to use these operators. So they are not really OpenShift specific or OpenShift dedicated uh, specific, but they are, well, they sol solve a very small and um, a small problem. Voila. So what is Monitors? I don't know how many of you knew that the alerts that are shipping with OpenShift, they also come with runbooks. And the runbooks are actually open source. So they are there on OpenShift, uh, GitHub OpenShift slash runbooks. Um, and they tell you what to do when an alert fires. And it's actually very good practice to put the link of the runbook into the alert. So an alert, which is, uh, that's an example here, that's how you would configure the alert in your alert manager. You also see this runbook URL there at the bottom, um, which can be directly clicked on if you see that alert and then you go to the runbook. Um, so it makes it easy for your SREs, even if woken up at 3 a.m. in the morning to just go through the runbook and do your stuff. So it will tell you about the meaning of that alert, what's the impact, how it can be diagnosed, and then that's the most important part, how to mitigate that alert. So you can copy and paste these uh, commands into your console and do stuff and then hopefully mitigate it. And if you're running OpenShift yourself, use these runbooks. If you're setting up alerts for your own um, workloads, also take inspiration from these runbooks because uh, it's a very neat and organized way of uh, making your monitoring more reliable, essentially. I said there are also some SRE alerts configured, which are not very OpenShift specific. And these are all open, also open, open source. These are in this managed cluster config repository um, where you have the SRE Prometheus alerts. And at the bottom here, you see configure alert manager operator Prometheus rule. So you will see a lot of friends from the previous slides also showing up here where you can just see how we are using um, this infrastructure and this, this, this setup uh, to monitor these clusters at scale. And as you saw in the, in the keynote, this, this is essentially it. If you're, if you're wondering why my cluster is down and nobody got alerted um, and you really, are, it's a pressing problem for you, instead of waiting for support, you can also do your own research and see um, how this alert is, would be triggered or not. Then what about logs? Um, these clusters are using Splunk for storing infrastructure logs. For that reason, there's a Splunk forwarder operator, which is using a, a small binary running as a daemon set um, on all the infra nodes. And then it's collecting the logs from the node and from the pods and just forward them to Splunk Enterprise. So no ma magic in here, but if you are using Splunk in your um, organization to collect logs or you just want to collect a subset, the Splunk forwarder operator is the way to go. So no need to reinvent the wheel. And you see that in that um, custom resource here, it's pretty straightforward to put a path name and then it will forward that stuff to your Splunk enterprise. So how do we fix things? That's uh, Roberto's meme. <laughs> 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 
he's, he's such a nice guy so that he put also memes into my slides. That's uh, very, very nice of him. So obviously you know this, yeah, right? You're sitting in, to, in fire, you get alerts in the morning, and then your colleague says, oh, alerts in Monday morning? This is fine. As we always get these Monday mornings. Just ignore them. They will go away. Just have your coffee. Um, and yes, you could log into these clusters and fix them manually with this, these run books. So that's maybe your first intuition on how to fix things. That's how we fix things if in our lab environments. In managed services, we made it a little bit harder to actually access these clusters because they are customer clusters. So as an SRE, you have to jump through some loophole, uh, loops in order to get there. So you coming through the public internet, connect to a bastion host, um, then set up a private link to this cluster environment. Then you can actually execute commands, um, but they are all locked to um, AWS CloudTrail or some other infrastructure. You get to get management approval. So you actually want to avoid that, logging into your cluster and doing things manually, but sometimes you have to. No, we want to do it in a more sustainable way. So. This is, from the, um, this is from the OpenShift documentation. Red Hat SREs are managing the infrastructure as code. We see words like GitOps workflows, CICD pipelines, um, and then it's talking about the review process. So you only get a review once some other SRE also approves it. So this is essentially the TLDR of uh, best practices of managing your uh, code environment. And everybody's hopefully following them, uh, fo following them. So never self-merge your PRs. Nobody's doing that. And um, with, this, with these Google search words, I uh, did some reverse engineering. How are we managing, actually, these CI-CD pipelines? And it turns out that we're using TestGrid. So TestGrid is a test infrastructure reporting platform from Google Cloud. It's still being worked on to be fully open sourced and taken out of this Google Cloud uh, repo, but that has been going on for 10 years now. Um, and if you click that testgrid.kubernetes.io link, you're presented with some really old school UI, but it works. And there's this Red Hat button among some other open source projects and some other vendors. And there's a myriad of uh, Red Hat test suits running here. You click there, then you see the tests, uh, test suits running. So it's really open how we do this CI CD process um, for managing all these clusters. And then you click on the test, on a failed test or on a successful test, and you're getting into Prow, which is another tool from the Kubernetes, environment, uh, Kubernetes world which is storing logs and, um, and running, running, um, running jobs. So it's a very good practice to just use the same tooling as the upstream community um, is using for your product. And that's what we're essentially doing here. And then there's a clue in here. It's called OpenShift OSD E2E. So that looks like OpenShift dedicated end-to-end -end test. So maybe there's some more information in here. Um, Turns out that we have another repository in the GitHub OpenShift org, which is the test framework. So it's a portable end-to-end -end test framework, which supports deploying clusters into multiple environments. It performs cluster health checks and upgrades. So that's the workflow here, captures the log, so nothing special in here. So you might be thinking, how can I use that for my own purpose? Because I'm using Jenkins and, and stuff. Um, well, there's a, there are some there's some documentation in there how you would write tests for Kubernetes clusters because it's, it's a little bit different than writing tests for your, um, let's say, Python application or Golang binary because you're setting up a cluster and you want to make some checks. So there's an example for checking image streams. Uh, this framework is called Ginkgo, named after a plant. So I think it's all coming from some vegetables, cucumber, Ginkgo, who knows, uh, but it, it pretty reads like English. So um, the suit is called Informing Image Streams. Then we need to get some image streams from the cluster. It's just a one-liner. One you list all the namespaces. You get all the image streams um, into a list. And then you count 
all the image streams in there. There we see this magic number of 50. Whoever came up with this number of 50, but supposedly there should be 50 image streams in your cluster for that test to pass. And instead of maybe writing your own test suits or even reinventing some tests, you think, you get the enlightenment, and then you get stars in your eyes. So there's a lot of test suits already in this um, OpenShift end-to-end -end test suit where you can take inspiration from. Or you might uh, wonder why is this error always happening in my cluster? Do they have a test? Let's go and explore. So it's a funny exercise for a Sunday morning in the sun. And maybe you want to do that right after that, uh, this talk, um, after you got inspired by this myriad of uh, re open source repositories which make managed OpenShift services run. It's not fully open source, so there's still something, some, some secret source to it, but we're getting there and opening it up uh, for everybody to inspect. So that uh, we still have five minutes for up for questions. Skate man. I know the six position operators on top of uh, general open shift. How is that trouble and have there been how is that trouble on the set with that? Yeah. So you counted six additional operators on top of OpenShift. Actually there's more. I would say it's probably in the ballpark of twenty or thirty. 30 additional operators there, and the question is how much additional overhead is that in terms of cost? I think um, I never really did the um, run Kepler on it uh, to actually count the CPU cycles wasted. Um, it adds some cost, I would guess, but uh, they are really lightweight. So essentially, they're, they're just checking a, um, a configuration, and then they are um, setting up another configuration. So. There is some overhead, but then you don't want to care about um, these operators as a customer because we, may, we care about um, the infrastructure nodes and the control plane. So it's the SRE way of, of doing things and uh, monitoring this stuff. And I think it's uh, more lightweight than, well, having some external querying of the API. So to answer your question precisely, I don't know but uh, it's probably um, less involved than we might think. Yeah. Have another question? They are both. Uh, so um, you, we have uh, um, reusable. Uh, so we have these emission controllers um, and also the webhooks. Are um, they reuse, reusable or just OpenShift specifics? So they are both. There are some of them that are just for um, Kubernetes clusters itself. So pure upstream. And uh, there are one that are specific for uh, OpenShift and others that are specific for uh, the SREs. So they need to rely on these web rails in order to be able to protect the cluster, to remove these web rails. And for that reason, they are different. But the most important part that you can uh, have these um, different uh, emission controllers as an inspirational to have ideas and to try to reproduce it instead of reinventing, uh, reinventing the wheel uh, again and again and again. For that reason, you can bring these ideas into your own clusters and reuse part of the, the code because they are all open sourced. Yep. So the question is whether the runbooks are updated on every OpenShift release. Last time I checked, there was some action on this repository, so I would guess they are updated, and I would hope they are updated. Um, but as you know, engineers are engineers, so probably they also sometimes forget to update stuff. Um, but this is an alive and kicking repository. So 
Um, yes, they are updated, but uh, can I guarantee for it? No. But, and I think the, these are, so that's uh, something that people often forget, that there are um, alerts shipping with your cluster and you actually know what to do with these alerts. So they're not just a uh, random gibberish of concatenated uh, nerd talk um, that you ignore, but you can actually look into a proper runbook and let that ex being explained for you. Okay, thank you. <laughs>